coming up on gamers week podcast all right next up the movie adaptation of the video game borderlands releases in theaters this friday august 9th and director eli roth says it's the kind of film where you shouldn't think too much and just sit back and take in the spectacle it is always a red flag when they're telling you before the movie's even out just try not to think so hard and you'll like it better (laughs) which to me says how bad is your script have you thought about taking drugs before coming to see this movie? <laughs> Make sure you get good and drunk, okay? <laughs> go on a Hunter S. Thompson binge and then write the script. And there you go. <laughs> then you've got something quality. Right. Do you think you could ever convince somebody that you were a time traveler? I had a thought of maybe going into like a Best Buy, right? Putting on my my 90s gear or, or early 2000s gear and going into a Best Buy and going to like the Geek Squad and say, hey, I'm, I'm here to pick up my, uh, my PS2. Mm-hmm. And they're like, huh? And you show them the ticket. Basically have it for around that same time, that same time frame, but back in like 2000. And say, yeah, get my... I see right here. I reserved the PS2. I'd like to pick it up. And they're just like looking at you like, uh, we don't sell PS2s anymore. And you're like, anymore? And then you kind of look at your receipt. You're like, oh, shit. I went to the wrong year. And just kind of like walk out. <laughs> <laughs> and just leave them absolutely dumbfounded. And for them to look like, like, did that just happen? And the next thing you know, you see that as like one of the top things on Reddit as a glitch in the matrix or whatever, like time traveler shows up at Best Buy. (laughs) It'd be better if you brought along a friend to like act like they didn't know you and stand in line and help you sell it. Like, did he say he was a time traveler? (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly, exactly. Because otherwise you're just another psycho. (laughs) Yeah, I would say definitely if you do it like in LA, they would just be like, oh, he's just, yeah, he's out of his mind. Another one. You think we have enough for a cold open? I got enough for your cold open. <laughs> you should warm it up first. I'm about to. Oh, God, you guys disappointing. Oh, very disappointing. We're just going to go ahead and start because I, I, I don't know how to move past this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome to Gamers Week Podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, the worst, and the weirdest headlines of the past week in the video game industry. This is episode 128, and today is Wednesday, August 7th. My name is Ryan, a.k.a. Retro Game Brews. I'm going to be your host for this evening, but I am not alone. I have two fantastic co-hosts with me. First of all is a woman who hates the game of golf, not because it's boring or she doesn't understand the rules. She just feels that you should always concentrate on more than one hole at once. Blue Williams, <laughs> Blue, how are you doing today? Um, yes, that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Move on. <laughs> no explanation required. None. You know me. You get me. <laughs> I feel seen right now. Yes, I do. <laughs> and next up, a man who believes uh. firmly that you never want to be the best looking person at the orgy. Donnie G. How are you doing today, Donnie? <laughs> huh? That's like, that's like one of those double not negatives. Like, you don't ever want to not know who you're not. I'm like, oh, okay, carry the one. I'm just waiting for an explanation of this strategy. Yeah. Well, uh, so if you're the best looking person at the orgy, that means everyone else is less like, good looking than you. So it's not as fun or exciting, right? There's no mm. leveling up, if you will. Okay. If you're the ugliest person at the orgy, it's like, wow, this is great. <laughs> Everyone's an upgrade. Ah, no, that's <laughs> good. You're getting shot down left and right. And everybody's like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah. Stop, then you're the only one left out at the orgy. And I think that may be worse. <laughs> Would you Just rather be at the, the orgy bar? and be like, you, you, not you, you're yeah. cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'm out. <laughs> but clearly that's never happened to any of us because we never considered the possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. On that note, why don't we go ahead and check out our reviews, reactions, and requests for the week. First up from Dreamcast Sagata. I don't like live streams in general and stopped using Twitch to watch streams years ago. Though I did try a few months ago and the ads were so bad, I quit. Never went back again. I keep forgetting it even exists. And clearly not listening to the live show right now. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) All right. Aww. (laughs) And next up from Love Retro BTW, I think people are overreacting about Twitch. And some don't even look at the hard numbers. I believe it's around 7 million active streamers with over 200 million active viewers a month. Twitch still holds a huge part of the streaming platforms, far from a zombie. Can, Can you guys hear that? No. What is it? There's an ice cream truck right outside my house. (laughs) Everybody be quiet. Nope. Can't hear it. Nope. Okay. Well, that's good. It's super annoying. So at least I'm the only one who's annoyed now. (laughs) And last up from Crystal Light Stone said, loved the trivia drama in this one. I did too. I thought it was fantastic. I loved uh, the fact that you guys were so competitive over basically (laughs) nothing. (laughs) And that's how we like it here. It's the principle of it. Right. I agree. I can't let Donnie win when he hasn't won. <laughs> as, as well, you shouldn't. I'm but just waiting again, for you it. Should, <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't be trying to paw up to Ryan and try to get extra points when it's like, oh. Paw well, up. No. That's an interesting phrase right there. Was I pawing you know, up to Ryan? Yes, because of the damn dog thing. Oh, it was a pun. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I was like, you were watching a different video than we were. <laughs> All right. So why don't we go ahead and shout out our patrons? We couldn't do what we do without the help of our gorgeous patrons. Here are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon. Seven Castle Forest, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Frank Grande, Love Retro BTW, Steven Sand, Ramboski, Terry Kinnear, Doongie Forever, A Gill 2020, Ducks in Disguise, Don't Make Me Pull Over This Car, Sir Coffee of House Blend, first of his name, Hybrid Divide, Matto 1606, You Fall Before Me, Davy PGH, The Red Ox, PDX Family, including Shannon and Luke. Zach Huge Thanks, Number One Blue Sick Boys Fan, John Baron, Sassy Sony, Evo Lust, Rai Rai's Secret Best Friend, Mega Retro Man, Gamatroid, Mora Deeb, Michael Lakite, Emo Esque, Bill Tucker, The Real Retro Game Brews, Fruitcakes Pickled Pepper, Ducks with Thick Thighs, Wizard of Zardoz, Bobs and Dugnut, Loud Moth, Retro Blast Pat, BNT Zilla Guy, and The Mad Milkman. If you like what you heard today, and we really hope you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as other cool stuff we'll be doing, like prizes and giveaways. You'll also gain access to our bi-weekly patron-only bonus cast called Gamers Week Uncut, Patrons with Benefits. Visit patreon.com slash gamersweek or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. Very nice. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at our headlines? This headline segment is sponsored by the Retro Game Club podcast. It's a fantastic, family-friendly retro gaming podcast. Retro? In each episode, retro, retro. <laughs> In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss, as well as news, interviews, and other topics. This week, for a special episode, they are discussing the July 1996 edition of 3DO Magazine. Great month, great year. Visit them at RetroGameClub.net or follow the link in the show notes. I can't imagine that 3DO Magazine was around for a while. I don't think it probably had a long run. <laughs> <laughs> it probably ended in July, if I'm not mistaken. Because right. it was oh. one. <laughs> one. <laughs> I Jesus. believe they pulled the plug on the 3DO in 1996. I would imagine because next year is like PlayStation's out. You've got Final Fantasy VII. Like I would have a hard time believing that the 3DO uh, would be running strong at that point. I was trying to Google uh, how many editions it had. Basically, there's not enough information and nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Even like how Google has that new AI overview um, at the top of every search page, it just says, it looks like there's not much info available about the number of editions of 3DO Magazine. <laughs> nobody knows. Nobody cares. Right. Nope. <laughs> All right, for our first article, Bungie is reportedly going to pull the trigger on layoffs regardless of the final shape success due to the leadership under delivering on financial promises to Sony. And a new report from journalist Stephen Titillo 
who spoke with several anonymous former Bungie employees, the 2023 cuts were quickly realized to be insufficient by at least early 2024, with the former employees allegedly said that cuts were planned even if the final shape did well. Late last month, Bungie laid off 220 employees and impacted developers have already expressed their frustration, anger, and disappointment on social media, especially in the wake of claims that CEO Pete Parsons spent $2.4 million on vintage vehicles over the past two years. What, like a 1980 Toyota sell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when news of that came out, I think the noise that you heard all over the internet was people sharpening their guillotines. Right. It's time to take this asshole out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's just such a bad look. Your your CEO gets caught spending that much money, but you can't possibly afford to keep these people on. You you built that big new headquarters, which then you can't fill because you laid off everybody. And you essentially oversold your company to Sony and then you had to make good on promises that I imagine you knew you couldn't keep. It's a really, really bad look. And especially if you were one of the developers who got laid off to know that it never would have mattered how well you did your job. Right. And the fact that the final shape actually was fairly well received and in a lot of ways brought Destiny back out of this nosedive that it has been in. So to find out that all your hard work meant nothing and you were going to lose your job no matter what. Yeah, that sucks. And I mean, you got to imagine they didn't say, oh, freaking word to these developers. Uh, on, so they were all laboring under the idea that their hard work was going to save their, their job. And that to me is just so unethical, so disgusting. And, and it really, it, it, it boils down to the fact that they, they tried to lay people off and apparently they just didn't lay off enough people, right? All right. You know, in order to, to save their financial targets. Well, this is where Senior leadership needs to take the fall for it. You oversold and underdelivered, so you shouldn't be. You shouldn't have to let go of twenty or thirty of your staff, or two hundred and twenty, or two hundred and twenty. You're the one that's directing the company where it should go, and these all these financial targets and everything like that. That's your job to set that. You f-ed up. You messed up. Your other team did not because they delivered a quality product, but your vision wasn't correct. So why should they have to take the fall? But they're not going to hold each other accountable for that kind of stuff because they all do the same thing. And this is such an accepted way for a small 1% of corporations to just yank the chain and control the livelihoods of all the normal folks that everybody thinks like this is just how you do business. And it never occurs to them to do anything Otherwise, you just weather a little bit of bad press, then you go on with business as normal, and there are no consequences for making bad decisions that cost people their livelihood. And we've been talking about unions for a very long time when it comes to game developers in the gaming industry, and that that's something that has been obviously fought very heavily uh, by big name companies. But this is the exactly the kind of thing that having a union would mitigate more or less when mm-hmm. it's collective bargaining when you have an opportunity to be uh the, have a seat at the table i mean i'm not like everything needs to have a union necessarily I, mean, I don't know if that's that's the solution to everything but again this is it's another example of why other developers have unionized and yeah this is the, the yeah this is the consequences when you don't Yeah. I mean, there has to be balance in everything. When unions get too much power, then that creates their own problems. So it does need to be somewhere in the middle. But right now, all the power is with a few people in all of these game companies. And it's it's just creating carnage everywhere you look. All right. Valve unintentionally set the stage for today's digital economic hellscape. According to Giannis Volk. Borafikas? How, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> that Borafikas. Borafikas? That's really Barofikas. how you pronounce it. Sure. Giannis Borafikas, yep. former nice. economist and resident at Valve as V-Guy, describes it. He no longer lives under capitalism. Instead, he says we're in the age of techno-feudalism where Elmer Elf 
Mari- Elmer Fudd? <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Algorithmic fiefdoms masquerade as marketplaces and dictate the terms of exchange while producing none of the goods themselves. Amazon is a prime example, as is the Apple App Store. Verifucus says that during that time at Valve, the company didn't want to create techno feudalism, but its development of the platform that incorporated structured and monetized community exchange, like the TF2 hat trade, helped pave the way for the digital fiefdoms to follow my brain hurts <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i've ever researched in this concept of techno feudalism i get what you're saying though uh if you look back into ancient europe ancient japan um, the concept of feudalism is kind of what you were just talking about blue a few people who happen to own the land uh, take all, uh, reap all the benefits while everybody else doesn't. Mm-hmm. So I, I get the analogy, but is Vail completely to blame for this? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were just the ones who did it the best and set the blueprint for everybody else to follow. I think that's fair. I also think that if they didn't make it, somebody else would have. Are, are we talking specifically about the Steam store? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Basically, it's saying it, it by it being a platform where everybody else uploads their stuff to, right? They don't create a product. The only product they have is a server, right? Yeah. So the, the idea behind feudalism, too, is if you, you own a plot of land, you don't do anything, right? You just so happen to have owned the land. So I think that's where the analogy is coming in here. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at Twitch. We're on Twitch right now. What, what <laughs> product does Twitch provide, right? Nothing. It's a service. They're just, yeah, yeah, they're a service. The they're a platform. But, okay, I'm trying to understand this. <laughs> Masquerade is marketplaces. It's it's still a marketplace because people upload their content and you go there and you buy it if you want to. They have sales that says, hey, this game was $39. Now we're having a sale because nobody's buying it. We're going to drop it down to $5.99. Like, oh, great, $5.99. I'll try it out. I, I yeah. don't see how that's not a... How that's not a marketplace, how that's... Well, no, it is a marketplace, but the the thing being is that Valve doesn't make games. But they tell you what you can do with your games. They tell you what you can sell your games for and where. And they took a cut of it. Right. But they haven't done anything. Besides run a server. Right. Ah, but that's the thing that they did. They They provided that service to different companies that say, hey, you don't have that way to reach all these other people. You're just a small fledgling game studio we are valve we created half-life so people know us let's go ahead and yeah come on over here buddy go ahead and list your game for sale we're going to take a little bit of cut because i mean obviously hey we're providing you with this platform nobody knows who you are this will get your name out there yada 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 they are doing something they're still creating that platform because are we going to go down that road where all of these other different companies now have their own service i know ea did ea's got their own platform where they say hey buy our games um, what's the Fortnite Epic? Epic Games Epic, has yeah. their platform. You know, it's it's just like the all of the the cable companies and the streaming platforms that they broke out and they say, hey, we're going to create our own platform. We're going to create our pla- our own platform. People are getting tired of that, and then it's all going to go back to where all those things go away. And there's like, oh, it's it's too much money for us to have our own platform. Let's just go back to have yeah, Valve. Yeah, we're just going to put our things on there, and you can tell us what to do. We don't care. So basically what you're describing is that it's like having a really big landowner that everybody can work on their land. Right? <laughs> and everyone gets just enough uh, that they start picking out their own land to, to, to utilize. And you know what? They just weren't making enough. So they're just going to go back to the, to the big land plot and make their money there. Yeah. So beefed them. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand what that is. <laughs> All right, next up is Pal World's profits are so massive that the devs' next-gen game could go beyond AAA. But the company's CEO doesn't want to wield such an enormous budget in a new interview with GameSpark Pocket Pair CEO Takura Mitsobi. Yeah, I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> Reveals that Pal World sales are in the tens of billions of yen much of which would typically be invested into the studio's next title. However, Mitsobi 
believes that pocket pairs just isn't structured to handle the scale of a game that Pale World's profits would allow for, which is just as well as he notes that there isn't any game he'd like to make with such an enormous budget anyway. Instead, he says, I want to pursue ideas that are interesting as indie games. Instead of putting all that money into a new game, why don't I just take it? (laughs) It's done so well. We'll buy some vintage vehicles and then we'll lay everybody (laughs) off and it'll be great. Uh, But we'll we'll throw you a pizza party on your way out. (laughs) (laughs) We'll lay off all your friends first, tell you that we kept you because you're the right person for the job. And then a few months later, we'll let you go. Yeah. I'll go buy my 1996 Toyota Supra. Here's your little Caesars hot and ready. This is an 89 Honda. How dare you? (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it's a different response, I guess, because normally when companies have a lot of money, they are going to use it. It's very rare to find somebody who will say, not only are we not structured to have to to handle that kind of a budget and the oversight that it it comes with, we don't want to do it anyway. We want to make our kind of games our way. And having smaller budgets allows you more freedom to be creative and take risks. And it's nice to hear somebody saying that we prefer that. I would love to see them invest it back into the developers, the employees, right? In some capacity, make their lives easier, pay for health insurance, whatever it is. I don't know. I think Japan probably has free health insurance. Bad bad example. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, like stock options or something, right? Just to to reward them for basically... (laughs) Making a Pokemon game with guns that Mm -hmm. just (laughs) went gangbusters. And I love that. I had kind of forgotten about Pal World. So I'm glad it's doing well. But like, what's he, what are they going to do with this money? Are they just leaving this in a cliffhanger? (laughs) They're not going to really invest it, or at least all of it, into another game because of he doesn't want to have that whole budget weight on his mind. But I can only assume that they're going to take some of it to start development on something else or maybe other little smaller projects. I also think it's potentially for them a VC type of money thing where they can invest in other developers that are making things that are super interesting, right? Where they can see an idea that they think will be big and try to invest in that and become a bigger studio, right? Like a fiefdom? Like like a fiefdom, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, and also it's a hell of a flex, right? Mm -hmm. Because you came up with this silly little concept and now you have literally more money than you know what to do with. And what is beyond AAA? Is that like quadruple A? Are we are we getting into like characters now because we've gone past A? I just feel like we should create another category, right? I think we should take a page from Sega's book and call it a super game. (laughs) <laughs> Sega's still relevant. Let's go. <laughs> I still find it ironic that Sega for years did not call things Super when Nintendo was. Um, right. just don't, they just called it Mega. <laughs> and their new game is Super Game. I just oh. You're right. Why is it not a Mega game? It's a Super Game. Mm. Time heals all wounds, okay? <laughs> or if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah, I think it's much. more of the, the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, next up, the movie adaptation of the video game Borderlands releases in theaters this Friday, August 9th, and director Eli Roth says it's the kind of film where you shouldn't think too much and just sit back and take in the spectacle. Speaking to Deadline, Roth said, I've always wanted to do something like this, just like a big fun crazy where you just shut your brain off, grab a bucket of popcorn, and laugh your ass off. However, Roth's comments are more interesting in the light of the movie's early critical impressions, which are calling the live-action film adaptation of Gearbox Loot Shooter, everything but a huge mistake to a disaster to a lifeless, unfunny, and visually repulsive job. <laughs> Not pulling punches over there, uh, Jesus. No, you got you got headlines to sell and, and clicks to get on your article. So yep. of course you're gonna say it's it's horrible. But I mean, I, I feel like both ways about this article because A, what did you expect it was gonna be? Right, right. It's not going to be Citizen Kane. Of course, it's just going to be lots of explosions and some roll your eyes humor and A-listers phoning it in in their performances because they got a huge paycheck. But it is always a red flag when they're telling you before the movie's even out, just try not to think so hard and you'll (laughs) like it better. Which to me says, how bad is your script? 
<laughs> Have you thought about taking drugs before coming to see this movie? <laughs> Make sure you get good and drunk, okay? <laughs> go on a Hunter S. Thompson binge and then write the script. And there you go. <laughs> then you've got something quality. Right. <laughs> this is either going to be a huge flop or a huge win. Is there a middle ground for it? No, because it's, I think, people's expectations, not of it being good, but just... It's true to the storyline or true to the game, the the content. No, more that the marketing has been insane. I cannot get away from Borderlands movie at, it is everywhere. It's on Twitch, YouTube, regular TV. They are, are really trying to push this. Okay. So I don't think there's a middle of the road for that. It's either, you know, feast or failure. Yeah, probably as far as the studio is concerned, if they don't make a quadzillion dollars, it was a failure. Right. But as far as audiences are, you know, we all know that critical reactions don't necessarily affect how people end up feeling about the movie. So I'm sure lots of people will still really like it. Your average Mm -hmm. audience goer will probably go, yeah, that was fun and move on with their life. It's not going to be a giant hit where people go back 17 times to see it like the Mario movie, but it'll probably be fine. I don't know, the the term visually repulsive dud. (laughs) Just sitting in the back of my brain and now I'm never going to get that out. Uh, But I might go see this movie just to to say I saw it, I I guess. I'll take his advice even. I'll go grab a bucket of popcorn and and go in there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take any drugs though. I want to be, I want to be ready. <laughs> Sam Disfaction says they'll sell little weed bags with every ticket. <laughs> they'll make a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but who's, the, who are the people that are calling this a huge misfire or a disaster? Is it like the upper echelon critic, like the old school Siskel and Ebert who have their noses stuck up at anything that resembles a video game movie. That's not something that's not art or that's not at the Cannes film festival. I don't, <laughs> Care to look at it. No. <laughs> Who knows who's exactly saying this well, kind of stuff about this film? Bite Size Breakdown writer Adriano Caparuso said it's filled with every cliche you can ponder. Awesome Friday critic Matthew Simpson said it's really bad. I really wanted to like it, but an uninspired plot plus several phoned in performances, plus being stuck in a weird place where it looks both expensive and cheap at the same time. <laughs> Ooh. Darren the Movie Reviews said it's great despite a rushed and dull screenplay. Uh, loud and Clear Reviews writer Edgar Ortega likened it to an out-of-touch executive who thinks the cool kids find this stuff appealing. Ooh. I think we said something to that degree about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, there we- right. So, I mean, it's not like your classic like Siskel and Ebert types, but these are – online reviewers right. of enough note that they were allowed to preview the film. So okay. but they're also the kind of people that need these types of headlines. Let's be honest. So yeah, of course they need that engagement. Right. It's clickbait pretty much. Well, yeah. I mean, you could write your headline one of two ways. The movie is the worst thing that's ever been put out or it's the best thing that's ever been put out. And the fact that they went with the worst thing, I do think that's a something. Sure. It's, it's not, like that Guardians of the Galaxy kind of like diamond in the rough. Nobody knew it was going to be good. And then all of a sudden right. people started talking about it. And you're like, oh, that, bad? <laughs> that could be this. We never know. Right. Well, it's not going to be because they stuffed it full of A-listers. And to Rye Bread's point, they are marketing the ever loving f- out of it. So it doesn't feel like you discovered the cool thing. It's like, just get this out of my face. I'm sick of it. <laughs> True. <laughs> Which I haven't seen anything for Borderlands. I actually saw one commercial a couple of days ago and I was like, oh, shit. yeah, that's that's coming out soon. So I had completely <laughs> forgotten about Borderlands because I was still on the Deadpool versus Wolverine hype. Webhead in the chat says this just makes me want to watch it more. <laughs> See, and it probably does. That's what I'm saying. I want to be that that person who's like, uh, I'm going to do my own research, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> As well, you should. Yes, you should. I can't wait to hear what people whose opinions I trust actually think of the movie. So, Donnie, it's on you. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't trust my opinion. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I've never played a Borderlands game, so I'm not going to be the one that goes in here with a very restrictive judgment. I, If I see this movie, I'm going to be the one that unplugs and disconnects my brain and just has fun with it. 
Right. Because mm-hmm. I won't be able to tell if this is staying true to the video, the original content or not. Yeah, um, I think average moviegoers will be fine. But like I said earlier, the fact that the director the, himself is saying it's best if you don't think. <laughs> that does still it leaves a little concern with me yeah it doesn't bode well a little no it just, doesn't bode well just skosh. <laughs> all right next up elon musk says his brain chip patience will soon outperform a pro gamer we really have an elon musk article on this. <laughs> 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 then takes a big old puff and says let's give people superpowers speaking on an episode of the lex friedman podcast musk said We feel confident that I think maybe within the next year or two that someone with a Neuralink implant will be able to outperform a pro gamer because the reaction time would be faster. In May, Neuralink issued an update on its first patient who implanted with the chip, Nolan Arbaugh, who noted his increased skills with brain-computer interface in video games. I'm beating all my friends in games that a quadriplegic, I shouldn't have to be beating them in. Uh... (laughs) So if you could be the best gamer on the planet, all you have to do is put Elon's chip in your brain. Would I do it? No. I, I, no. There was no sense of accomplishment there. <laughs> right. Yeah, but the number of people who buy cheat say that clearly the sense of accomplishment is not something that the majority of gamers really care about. Yeah, aimbots. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Map hacks. What is this going to do when – Everybody, I can't say everybody. I use that term loosely, okay? Uh, a, a big collective of people get this neural link implanted in their brain. And suddenly, they're all on the same level. Yeah, eventually, right? Uh, yeah. And then it has to do with, I don't know, maybe your brain capacity? I have no idea how this works, <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you. But I think elsewhere in the interview, he said brain chips are going to have to speed up human thinking processes because otherwise AI was going to get bored of us. Something like that. <laughs> God, he is so weird. Oh, my God. <laughs> it is weird. I'm excited and curious at the same time to see what happens with somebody who gets one of these things implanted. And if he or she decides to be a guinea pig and they say, hey, let's just ramp this shit up. All of a sudden, his brain just goes. <laughs> Comes and like a mine overnight. Yeah, he can do complex yep. mathematic equations or whatever. He's sitting there counting cards just like uh, Zach Galifianakis and Hangover and all that stuff. And that's the super mega human. This is how the mutants get started because this is the X factor. We got a neural link chip. It unlocks the mutation and shit just starts happening. That's the next step. TK85 says, I for one don't think any pro gamers have have to worry given some of Mr. Musk's more recent deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's an excellent point because you've got uh, Nolan Arbaugh, who has received great benefit from having the Neuralink. Being a quadriplegic, he can now do many things and beat his friends in games, and it's great. But what if you got like the equivalent of a Cybertruck put in your brain? Uh, it just stops working. <laughs> <laughs> it just fails all the time. Or, yeah. So I guess, at least for me, I thought like the the idea of cyberpunk 2077 was much farther off than than we are, I guess. <laughs> but eventually, right? Isn't that the whole idea is that you got to like upgrade your body and your brain to, to keep up? Uh, with the dystopian society that Elon Musk is creating for all of us. You don't want uh, Keanu Reeves in your head because you got a a virus? Yeah. (laughs) Johnny Mnemonic is the worst movie I've ever seen. Wrong! You take that back right now. You take that back. It is not a bad movie. It is so boring. Oh my God. It's amazing. Yeah. who am I debating with? You're, you're the, the person that doesn't even like Lost Boys. Shut the hell up. <laughs> we are not that far off from cyborgs. In probably another 50 or 60 years, we'll have a full-fledged like, okay, I lost my arm. Now I've got Bucky. I've got the Winter Soldier's arm here and I can do all this other <laughs> stuff. And and oh my God. Oh my God. I lost control of it. Oh my God. Please help somebody make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> what was this motion you were making <laughs> I, I, when you lost control of it? <laughs> I was cooking and baking something in the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turning some butter. It's like Murphy's Law, right? The worst thing that happened at the worst possible time. 
<laughs> so, I mean, in theory, though, like in another 20 or 30 years when the three of us, we're getting old, we're going to need, you know, things replaced and all that kind of stuff. What's the yep. first thing that you're getting a cybernetic replacement for? My back. My back. It sucks <laughs> right now. <laughs> like a whole new spine and everything, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, that'd be great. And the next thing would be my knees. So pretty much all my joints. Can I do that? Can I lump that in? Just joints. Just yeah, joints. they have the full package for it. <laughs> I'll take the joint package. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll be superhuman because I can like bounce, right? Ooh. That's what you want to do with your superhuman powers is bounce. Of course. <laughs> I'm going to be old and senile, right? I mean. <laughs> GoldenEye 1971 says, has no one seen Terminator? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. Apparently no one has seen it. All right. Next up, a real life goldfish just beat Elden Ring. Shadow of the... <laughs> 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 Erdtree's final boss, our hero is Tortellini, a noble goldfish who belongs to the creator or content creator Eric Point Crow Moreno. Point Crow has already proved just how good the fish is at Elden Ring when given access to the right tools. Uh, with the unique setup, Tortore- Tortorelli is able Tortellini. to tor- is it Tortellini? Yeah, Tortellini is, is able to input control commands simply by swimming around his tank. Developing or depending on where he swims to, he'll be able to press different buttons. And he is now able to defeat promised consort Radon this way, too. The whole effort was streamed on Twitch, and it's generally incredible to watch, even though Tortellini might never grasp the true greatness of his achievement <laughs> with his 10 second memory. <laughs> <laughs> How does this make you feel? Uh, well, I think it's hilarious because remember a few weeks ago when we said that FromSoft had to release a patch that made Elden Ring <laughs> DLC easier because people were complaining it's too hard, but the goldfish can beat the final boss of the DLC. Right. So what does that say? So I just think it's hilarious. You Clearly, made it too I easy. Need, yeah, I need to get some tutorials from Tortellini because I just am struggling <laughs> with a lot of the game. So... Perhaps that'll be Tortellini's next series is walkthroughs and guides. What do I do? Boop, boop. Yep, boop, boop, exactly. Boop. <laughs> How's that again, Ryan? Boop, boop, boop. boop, boop. <laughs> boop, boop. Uh, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> goldfish beat we got oh, isn't it the same goldfish that beat pokemon right this is the no, same yeah that was a different goldfish that oh. is a different goldfish a different content creator a different channel a different goldfish that one's probably dead Jesus! It's just a he took, fish, the yeah, he took a porcelain, you know, ride down the the, the tube. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, though, because remember uh, when we talked about that goldfish? I think we talked about how Pi couldn't figure out how to get out of the starting area of a Pokemon game, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but a goldfish right. could beat the game. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think perhaps we've been underestimating goldfish this entire time. <laughs> this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> We've been relying on chickens to play tic-tac-toe back in the day, but no, mm-hmm. that was not the pinnacle. We had to understand that it was goldfish. <laughs> that really, right. you know, our, our understanding of intelligence is extremely limited, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not the, the apes that are going to take over for Planet of the Apes. Mm-hmm. It's going to be Planet of the Goldfish. Goldfish. Yep. <laughs> They'll have apes carrying the bowls with the goldfish, and that's like... <laughs> We heard you've been eating us. <laughs> Webhead says, do the goldfish have the Elon Musk brain chip? Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's actually what happened. I think Tortellini has the brain chip and that explains everything. <laughs> it's all weird. This is the worst timeline. This is what happened. What was it that happened? It's the time traveler that you were talking about before the show started. Yes. <laughs> <It's> everything else. <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and take a look at our top three new releases for the week. All right, I I would like a moment to say that for the entirety of the time we've been doing this podcast, when I look up the top three new releases, my source has always been Game Informer. And this week, I pulled up the Game Informer site and there was nothing. There was just their fond farewell, thanks for 33 years, et cetera, et cetera. I was saying, yeah, can we play little taps here? (laughs) (laughs) That's it. 
<laughs> That's it. <laughs> First up this week, Cat Quest 3 out on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Play as a swashbuckling privateer in this 2.5D open world action RPG set in a fantastical pirate themed world, the Caribbean, an archipelago swarming with pirates. Alongside your trusty spirit companion, set sail through the Caribbean in your very own ship, but beware the seas are dangerous and a meowtony is nigh as the hordes of pirates under the order of the pirate king hunt you down. Don't cringe. You love it. <laughs> Next up is Signy, Signy, all guns blazing out on PS5, Xbox Series X and S and PC. An unrelenting onslaught of eye popping visuals, ear bursting soundscapes and mind melting action makes Signy the vanguard for the next generation of shoot 'em ups. Outgunned, outmanned and out on your own, plunge into a sky full of hell in a last ditch battle for survival. And then finally, Deathbound out on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, and PC. Deathbound is a one of a kind party based souls like set in a callous world where faith and science clash. Dynamically transformed between fallen warriors, all with their own unique skill sets, combat styles, and rich history. Face challenging enemies crafted to push you to your limits. Their very nature is based on the five stages of grief, with each new encounter commanding the attention of any soul who dares face them. So out of these three, what are you in for this week, Donnie? <sighs> Not Cat Quest 3, unfortunately. Ooh. All of those different puns, I, I mean, it looks okay. It looks very comical. Um, I might play it some other time, but I'm not picking it up as a new release. Deathbound, um, I saw the trailer for it, or I saw the gameplay of it. It looks interesting. Um, I already have too many souls like games that I haven't played yet. Uh, I started dark souls three, never finished it. I still have yet to start Elden ring. So another souls like game out there that, that I'm just going to put on the backlog. I think I can wait on this one, which leads me to Signy all guns blazing. It looks freaking amazing. And I sure do love a shmup. The artwork is just phenomenal. Um, I'm not sure about what the gameplay is going to bring, but just from the uh, from the trailer alone, I think I'm going with Signy this week. I'll give it a chance. Okay. What about you, Rybred? So the three genre of games that I am not good at are uh, Souls like <laughs> action RPGs, and bullet hell shooters. And that's all of these, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Deathbound, Souls like. Uh, to be honest with you, like it, it I, get, I get the the more sci fi look to it. So I guess that's kind of fun. It's yeah. not based in medieval times, but it's still a Souls game eventually at, at, at the core of it. Um, man, Signia is definitely bullet hell. Um, that makes me anxious. I don't know what it is, but I just can't concentrate well enough to dodge everything. And that's why I hate those games. <laughs> Cat Quest 3 looks really nice. It's for, especially, you know, I, I would... It would be one of the games I'm surprised is just not on the Switch solely because it just looks like what you would think of as a Switch game, right? But it's an action RPG. And um, I'm going to take the opposite stance on this one, Donnie. The reason I'm not picking that one is because of the puns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Puns are, are the lowest form of humor. That's what I've been told. Disagree. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go with none of them this week. Wow. Okay. You're no fun. You're right. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, what about you? What are you picking? Obviously, Cat Quest 3. Obviously. Obviously. I love the puns, but also I love the first two games. They were so fun. Just cutesy, little, low pressure action RPGs. Signy, I'm not a big fan of shoot 'em ups anyway. Though I, I hope it's good. It, you know, it's an interest. It's a genre that people really love. So it would be nice to have more options, more modern options there. Deathbound, the Souls like it looks pretty good. It's an interesting thought that it's party based, but all the characters like live inside your one player character. So you just push a button and then you go from the samurai to the the spell thrower. 
uh, which is yeah. an interesting twist on it. And it looks pretty good. But to Donnie's point, there are still tons of souls like that I need to play that are on the backlog. So of these three, Cat Quest 3. Very nice. And if I'm not mistaken, and help me remember or recall Blue, but doesn't Ryan have now four months left? Four months. For two. Three. Three. Three, three, so, three. Mm. 15 hours each, three different Souls games. This is what he promised us. Yeah. And I, I think but based on his, his facial expression um, right there is I, I think we're going to be a couple of disappointed kids on Christmas. <laughs> you Aww. knew that was going to be the case anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been so good all year. Right. <laughs> I've got a disappointed face kink anyway, so it's all working out for me. <laughs> Fair enough, uh, I guess. You're right. When you said this is my this is my resolution for the year, I was like, there's no way in hell. No way. No way. No. You just lied to us. Yeah. Straight, straight to, to our, our face. face. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no remorse. <laughs> <laughs> I see. All right, before we move on, let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor. This segment is proudly sponsored by A Gamer Looks at 40 podcast. The show explores the history of video games through the stories and experiences of the people who lived it. This week, Bill is joined by cosplayer Mama Tara to talk about her personal journey of fandom and how this character helped her through her challenging times. So this week's question is, if you could body swap with an RPG character for one day, who would it be and why? Let Bill know the answer by sending him a tweet at Gamer Looks at 40 on Twitter. Body swap. So what is, I mean, do I have to live in that character's life for a day? Or is it just that I get their body and they get my old man body? I mean, it's more fun if you're living as that character for the day. Like in a Freaky Friday situation. Right, right. Like, you know, the daughter had to go through the mom's whole day and the mom had to go through the daughter's whole day. and. That would be fun to you, but 99% of all <laughs> RPG characters are going through some shit. <laughs> yeah, but shit. It's, it's just one day. <laughs> I'm, I'm old. I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> See, Gamer looks at 40 in the chat here to monitor his segment says, yes, think Freaky Friday. Right. And I will say this. I don't want to swap characters with anybody who's facing an existential crisis, has to save the world, has to dodge enemies on a continual basis. Do you have one that just sits there and watches TV all day? Because I will choose that one all day long. Lame. You don't want to take down a god just for once? No. <laughs> I'm perfectly no. comfortable. <laughs> if you would have asked me this when I was 20, I'd be like, let's do this. But yeah. We're getting we're getting close to that age where I'm just like, no. Not even so. 40 and he's already just resigning himself to the old yep. man existence. <sighs> because what That's happens if so that fun. if that character swaps with you and does something to your body in your old age state, now you come back to it, you're like, what the f is this? Right. <laughs> it's like the, the guy from uh, Assassin's Creed just jumps off a building, lands it, tries to go land in some hay. <laughs> Doesn't roll right. 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 But okay, so let's say he breaks your neck and dies with your body, and then you just get to keep his. So then I would choose a female character. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot. <laughs> female characters are way better looking. Uh, I don't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See, uh, and my answer was going to be Jennifer from. The Witcher, because then you get to spend a day with Geralt. Oh, Geralt. Mr. Cabell. Yes. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you know, you, uh, you could look at it your way too, I guess. <laughs> what about you, Downey? Um, we'll go with what's the, the dude from Final Fantasy 3 that has the airship that's the gambler. Uh, it's a shadow. What is his name? Uh, Zetzer. Zetzer, there you go. Mm -hmm. And because you said Final Fantasy 3, I typed it in there and nothing came up. So I had to put <laughs> sick. <sighs> the internet Whatever. doesn't lie. Ever. Ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ever. Not once.
All right, hey there, fellow kids. It's time once again to take a trip back to when things were simpler, before loot boxes and battle passes, when mobile games were something you played on your Game Boy or Game Gear or a Tiger handheld if your grandma didn't understand what you wanted. Yes, this is the Retro Rewind for August of 2000. Let's take a look at some of the top Billboard songs and their artists this month. Number one was a song called Incomplete by Cisco. <laughs> wow, okay. I know one Cisco song and it ain't and that, that one. Is, yeah. <laughs> Not this one. I don't know what this song is. I, I, I meant to go back and kind of take a listen to some of the songs on here that I didn't recognize. This was at the top of the list and I didn't get a chance to do it. So I'm at a loss for words, but this one's number one. Uh, number two was Bent by Matchbox 20. I'm sure you guys remember that one. I think so. I'm not, not broken. I'm just a little. Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah. 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 yep, yep, yep. It's gonna, gonna, gonna. It's gonna be May by NSYNC. Jumpin', Jumpin' by Destiny's Child. Try Again by Aaliyah. I Want to Know by Joe. And talk about the most generic name ever for an artist it's joe <laughs> okay joe mama <laughs> <laughs> everything you want by vertical horizon absolutely quote story of a girl by nine days do you guys remember that one mm, mm-hmm. this oh, is story a story of a girl, of a girl. Yep. Yep. yep 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 higher by creed creed was still up there and um what's the band from canada that everybody nickelback. Hates? nickelback nickelback had not yet earned the hated status that creed had received and last but not least is doesn't really matter by janet jackson i think the nsync one may be the most important song of our generation for the memes I would say I... Backstreet Boys, you are. <laughs> but well, you no. can be memes from that. Yeah. I think it's more important because of the amount of TikToks and videos that have come out from somebody randomly singing that song and everybody just joins in. I think that mm. it's going to be me now is more important because it's been in two Marvel movies, X2 <laughs> and Deadpool Wolverine. Thank you for spoiling that for me. I appreciate it. When's the last time you heard somebody name drop X2? I was talking about Deadpool Wolverine. I haven't seen that yet. (laughs) I I know. I'm just saying. (laughs) Taking a look at what was hot at the theaters this month back in 2000. Uh, Top of the list was Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon. Very good movie. uh Space Cowboys about a bunch of old geriatrics going into space. Nutty Professor... Two, The Clumps, a.k.a. Fatty's Fart 2. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that reference. <laughs> uh, and uh, Webhead is actually you. Actually. He says, bye, 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 is in Deadpool, Donnie. Uh, you're right. You're right. You're right, Frankie. You're right. You're right. I saw a headline Sorry. that it shot back up to like the top of the charts after Deadpool came out. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Oh, uh, uh, what lies beneath? I believe that was with Harrison Ford and Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. That's a great one. I think your wife is starting to suspect something. I think she's starting to suspect something. Who? Oh, then he your goes wife. your wife. Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to just pull it all. Wah, wah, wah. Mm. Coyote ugly. Bunch of girls dancing on a bar. Whatever. I've been to the original, by the way, of that. So have the I. Rich, the bar. It's it's yeah. disgusting. Yes. Down in Memphis? <laughs> no, the one that they had in New York City when oh, they first started it. Yeah, okay. it's like the original. And uh, <laughs> it's so skeezy. When I asked for darts, she goes, well, we've only got the one. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> And you really mean to tell me that, especially back at the age you were in the year 2000, you didn't see that a bunch of times? Me? Uh, I've never seen the movie. Really? That's yeah. That's surprising. You've seen such quality movies normally. I I am a connoisseur, but that one just looked like it did nothing for me as far as a plot. Yes, they wrote it for the plot. <laughs> well, I've never even seen Showgirls. I would highly recommend seeing that because that's it's, it's so bad. It's a good movie. Okay. Uh, the Cell with Vincent D'Onofrio. And yes, that was so creepy. That Jennifer movie Lopez. was. Yes. 
That movie was just ridiculous. Uh, that was a mind job of a movie. Mm-hmm. And one thing I still remember about that one is with the horse. The horse is in that little thing, and all of a sudden the blades come down, and then it, like it makes this guttural scream. And next thing you know, the box just expands, mm-hmm. and now you see all the little pieces of the horse with the heart still beating and all that stuff, and yada yada. And I was not thirty-two in the year two thousand. <laughs> take that back. <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. Next up is The Replacements with Keanu Reeves and John Favreau and Gene Hackman. Really great fun movie if you just disconnect your brain. Uh, Autumn <laughs> in New York. <laughs> Never seen that one. The original, the OG X-Men came out this month back in 2000. And I do remember seeing that in the theaters. And last but not least, Bless the Child, which... Sounds like a horror no movie. No clue. Yeah, it sounds like it, but I don't know. Next up in the news, Sony to ship only 1 million PS2s by holiday season. As part of what Sony predicts will be the largest consumer electronics launch in history, the much-anticipated Sony PlayStation 2 will go on sale in North America on October 26 for a suggested retail price of $299, the same price as the original PlayStation when it launched in September 1995. But you'll need to pre-order your PS2 now if you want one for the holidays. Sony will ship only 1 million units to North America before the end of the year. Nearly that many were sold in the first two days of the system's Japanese launch in March. Wow. Right. Sony will ship only another 2 million units to North America by March 2001, not guaranteed in time for the crucial holiday season. TKN85 says, those jerks ruined my Christmas. My PS2 pre-order didn't arrive until February at Babbage's. Best Valentine's Day ever, though. (laughs) Right? (laughs) A host of top Sony executives revealed the details of the PS2's American launch before a crowd of more than 1,000 media representatives at Sony Studios in Los Angeles on May 10th, the day before this year's Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3. Sony predicted that the PS2 will have 51 games available when it launches, the most ever for a console launch, according to Sony, with 56 more games by March and another 80 games in development beyond that. Sony's first-party games will retail for $49.00. The same price as the original PlayStation games. The PS2 will come with a DualShock 2 controller, while additional controllers will cost $34. Multi-taps and 8 megabits of memory cards will also retail separately for $34 each. Did you guys get a PS2 on launch? No. No. <laughs> no? no? Mm-mm. I went the route of Xbox. I, I didn't go with play, PlayStation 2, which, and it just had to do with what my friends were playing. Everybody was playing Halo. Like, that was like a phenomenon. Of course. So, of course. So mm-hmm. you just, you play with what your friends play. In. I went the route of poor college student. And That's fair. <laughs> yep. Had to wait <laughs> uh, several years until I was in grad school, actually, before I scraped together enough to get one of the slim versions. I did not get one at launch. Um, I do remember getting one in like <laughs> February or March. What's what's uh, Sam Disfaction says not everyone was 32 and had their own money to buy one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's wrong, Donnie? I was 22 and I put my PS2 on a credit card, which I then paid off several months later. OK, next up, mm-hmm. Nintendo mm-hmm. Star Cube. Before Nintendo 64 was released, it had two other names, Project Reality and Ultra 64. Dreamcast was Katana and Black Belt before Sega landed on its final title. No one expects Nintendo's new system to be called Dolphin when it reaches store shelves. Days before E3, evidence surfaced that Nintendo had registered trademarks for a video game system called StarCube. Nintendo deftly avoided being pinned down on the name. We're not likely to hear what the name of the new system is until it makes its debut in Japan at Space World in late August. 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 So, August. if they would have called it the Star Cube as opposed to the GameCube, do you think that would have caught on and fit well with people? No, no I think that would have been worse. Uh, really? Absolutely. Yeah, because it's like it's not a star. So why would you? It's it's the complete opposite, right? Right. I mean, GameCube, it is what it is. A cube right. that you, plays game. So perfect. Yeah, Star Cube. Star isn't even a Nintendo thing. You could have called it Super Cube, and that would have been fine. 
Kind of. I mean, so when you when you say star, it makes me think of Star Road and Mario. That's about it. That's Which the only correlation. Which most people never even saw. So. Yeah, because they weren't good enough. Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at some of the articles from the readers this month. Glue sniffing, slack jawed mouth breathers. What's up with the slack jawed mouth breathers who are eagerly anticipating the demise of the insert the name of any major console system currently on the market or expected to be released in the near future? I can't stand seeing letters and emails that seem to have only one purpose to bash one system and promote another. I can respect another gamer's opinion, but it seems that these correspondences always come down to a brief juvenile rant of what amounts to name calling. My God, people, if you have a beef, at least try to legitimize it with more than the middle school bravado, i.e. Sega sucks, Sony rules, me go potty now, oops, me no make it, uh, Sega sucks. I cannot understand system bias. I own a Sony PlayStation, an N64, and a Dreamcast. That's a rich kid right there. And Mm -hmm. I enjoy all three systems. I think any serious gamer should be excited to be alive right now. I don't plan on purchasing a PlayStation 2 when it is initially released in the States, but I most likely will eventually own one. The Xbox has me curious, but I need to know much more about both systems and possible developers before ever entertaining the thought of buying it. What has me so ecstatic is that all the choices I have. Why the hell would anyone want a system to fail just for spite? I enjoy my PlayStation, but I sure as hell don't want Sony to be the only game in town. Pun very much intended. Thank you. So he goes on for a little bit more, and I'm not going to go ahead and read all of this stuff. But do you feel like we are kind of past that point now with the way things are happening? No. Okay. That's an instant no. Yeah, as no. instant, I have you. Were you on Twitter today? <laughs> you would have seen a thousand examples of exactly this. I was briefly on Twitter, and it was mostly reading our DM groups and maybe one other thing. That's it. So I, it's not like I continuously scroll through Twitter and look at all the bullshit that's there anymore. I just can't stand it. And that's exactly what it is that they're describing is all this right. bullshit. Okay. <laughs> right. So the fact that you already know you can't go on Twitter because it's full of this stuff. Nothing has changed since the year 2000. So the last thing I'm going to read is called Question of the Moment. Are you glad that Final Fantasy IX is returning to the series fantasy roots or do you like the futuristic stuff? I liked Nine. Nine was like a love letter to the old stuff. I think it was done really, really well. I think the character development was fantastic. Uh, the spells were fantastic as well. Uh, it just felt very familiar. Uh, where Eight was such a departure. I mean, Seven was a huge departure. Don't get me wrong. But Eight was even a bigger departure from that original formula. So like Nine felt like it was kind of like coming home again. But Ten was... Uh, Actually, I'd, I've never played 10, so I can't really say that. <laughs> Go on. What was 10? <laughs> Sucked. It was terrible. It's awful. Worst what? Game. <laughs> what about you, Blue? Um, I think fantasy is fine. I don't think the setting matters. I think the story matters. And Agreed. this was still back when Square knew how to tell an amazing story. So I don't think it matters where they would have set this. I have yet to play 9. It has been on my backlog list for a while. You know, I can sit here and make the argument that RPGs, like I don't have time to sit down and play them, but I do because I'm playing a game like Ghost of Tsushima, which is going to take uh, tens of hours to get through. So nine is definitely on my backlog list. But some of these people, I have uh, email addresses for some of these people that responded about how they feel about Final Fantasy IX. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to email them collectively from the Gamers Week podcast account, seeing if any of these email addresses that were alive and well back in August of 2000 are still alive and well and how they feel about Final Fantasy series as a whole this time. And how many of these people have like a AOL email address? (laughs) Um, At least three. (laughs) Wow, still. Yeah. I mean, granted, they probably don't check it, right? Probably not. They probably moved on to something else like Hotmail or Yahoo or whatever. Something modern like Hotmail. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Games released this month were Chrono Cross, Lego Rock Raiders, and Star Trek Invasion for the PS1. Hidden and Dangerous, Power Stone 2, and Sega Marine Fishing for the Dreamcast. Mario Tennis, NFL Quarterback Club 2000, International Superstar Soccer 64, 
and Turok 3 Shadow of Oblivion for the N64, and bringing up the rear with Perfect Dark for the Game Boy Color. There was a Perfect Dark on Game Boy Color? Apparently, there was a Perfect Dark for the Game Boy Color. I wonder how that worked out. (laughs) It's like wow. Doom on an Atari. <laughs> <laughs> I think Doom on an Atari would work a lot better. Oh, hell yeah. All right, kids. Thanks for hanging out with me this evening. Unfortunately, we can't stay here. We have to go back to being adults. Back to a timeline where Olympic athletes are currently being celebrated not only for their pole vaults, but for the poles themselves. <laughs> you, sir, are a legend. You may have flopped on your Olympic attempt, but I guarantee you'll be swimming in pole vault attempts now that the Olympics are over. Yeah, that will be the only flop that he has. <laughs> Just imagine if you won and you had to like explain to people like, no, 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 it, it, it's still a good size, right? <laughs> 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 All right. On that note, let's thank you for listening to episode 128 of Gamers Week podcast. And a big thank you to the Retro Game Club podcast, Love Retro BTW, and a gamer looks at 40 for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the show notes. And if you want to connect with Gamers Week, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Watch us right here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Gamers Week podcast, where we will record live every Wednesday at 8.30 Central Time. Email us at gamersweekpodcast at gmail.com. Visit our merch store at gamers-week-podcast.creator-spring.com. Or if you want to do it the easy way, follow the link in the show notes. And last but not least, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersweek. Finally, since you made it all the way to the end of the episode, please leave a rating and review to let us know how we did. Really do value your feedback. And while you're there, consider subscribing to iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. Webhead says, I feel so engorged <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, be careful when you pole vault, Frankie. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we pole vault. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it took us to the end of the show to make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> floppy. There he goes. Floppy. Floppy. Yes. I said floppy. <laughs> All right. Well, good night, everyone. <laughs> good night. Good night. I got nipple hair. I just don't have chest hair. Same, same. <laughs> I got belly hair, and the, uh, but then, yeah, there's nothing attractive yeah. about shaving something into belly hair. Uh, I feel that I've I've learned a lot about both of you tonight. Mm. And you just jumped in, so. The more you know. <laughs> Lucky me. <Right>? <laughs> <laughs>Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut, patrons with benefits. This is the unscripted patron-only bonus cast with less editing and more dirty jokes. We don't know where the conversation will go, but we're sure it will be weird. This fish just went right on my nipple. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I Google Street Fighter 6. The first search result that comes up is, people think they can see reused in the Street Fighter 6 reveal. <laughs> Listen up here, kids. You're not going to want to get one of those VD STDs things, right? Make it fall off. When you go, grab a pro. You'll be doing it for America. That was perfect. (laughs) If you want to hear weekly episodes of our patron-only bonus cast, join us at patreon.com slash gamersweek.